Welcome back to the Cheap Heat Productions podcast. Okay, welcome back to the podcast. And today on the show, I've got a great guest, a man whose views I respect highly. You probably know him from various podcasts online, and he's been on Arsenal Fan TV a few times as well. Kenny Ken, how are you today, sir? I'm all good. I'm all good. I'll tell you one thing, right? It's anticlimactic in the you know in the England at the moment. You know, Pete, you know, we just about got over the fact that it didn't come on. We now watch yeah. the Olympics. I must say, the coverage of the Olympics had it not been. For the Euro sport would have been um, abysmal. The BBC are doing their best, but they could do better. And I don't know whether you're a cricket fan or not, but it's cricket, cricket, cricket. But no substitute for the football. Can't wait for the season to start. Yeah, actually, the coverage of the Olympics on our national broadcaster is pretty poor here as well. I think it's down to a lot of things are happening oh. kind of overnight. Oh, right. Have you got... Are you? Is it um, Radio Televisarum doing it? Um, over there, yeah, yeah. Oh right, oh because you know they're normally they're normally like you know very very accomplished. Obviously, known from afar, but obviously I'm I I do see a lot of aim and Dumphy. You know, Johnny Giles, <laughs> although they're no longer in a radio television airing. I know that um, Richie Sadler's still on there, and I know Deep Deep um is on there. And one thing I love about you know the punditry in Ireland is that there's no there's no kind of um, pulling punches. You actually describe the match. You, I think in Ireland, you have a sort of an attitude where basically there's two things that I think your the Irish viewer doesn't seem to like. And that's something that you, you we have a lot in this country. You seem to hate kinsmanship and you seem to hate stats. You think yeah. that... And I, I, I think that when I watch some of the punishment, because it does come on YouTube, you're actually talking about the match. I don't see any evidence of any like... Status statistics. It's just this is what's happened, and you go in in great detail, and you tell the public how it is. In England, it's all about stats. Yeah, and people worm their way in, and there's a lot of kinsmanship as well, where people don't say as it is. But I do love it in Ireland that you don't you don't seem to be afflicted by kinsmanship and stats. Yeah, they kind of say it as it is over here now. Unfortunately, Eamon Dunphy isn't on the television anymore, but he was infamous over here for some of the stuff yeah. he said. Like, he got in a lot oh. of trouble over here. He's he's one man I've actually sent an email to last week hoping to get on this show to talk about some of those funny TV moments. So, well, you, see, you know, you know, um, you know, Eamon Dunphy used to be a member of the Labour Party here. He's one of, he's one of ours. And he, you know, yeah. he, he, his, his kids are Mancunians. Because he married a, a Salford girl, and he, yeah. so he, he's 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 got a massive, massive. Obviously, he's moved to Ireland with his second wife, but you know he's got his connection is English, and and I know when I was watching off the ball, he was very determined for Italy to win the final because he couldn't handle the fact he couldn't handle uh, well us enjoying ourselves too much and boasting about the fact that we're the best in the world. So I I do I do keep an eye on what goes on in the Republic. Funny enough, I met him in person. It was the day Arsene Wenger was sacked. Um, it was around, I think it happened around 10 a.m., didn't it, that morning? Mm. And I seen it on Sky Sports News before I left the house. I was living in Dublin at the time. Mm. And I was walking to get my bus up a place called Camden Street. Mm. And it was like 11 o'clock in the morning and Eamon Dunphy was outside having a smoke and a whiskey outside the bar. And I went up to him and I was just chatting with him and I said, oh, what do you think of Arsene Wenger leaving? And we just had a brief conversation and he was loving life, having a drink with his friend like well, at that time in the morning. Cool guy. Well, definitely. He's, he's a very intelligent man as well. He's got, you know, he's got, he, he's like, he's not like a test tube where you just put him into, you know, talking about Man United or, you know, the Republic or international football. He's, he's got a 
you know, good grasp of um, literature. He's a bit of a singer as well. And he, and he, he is passionate about Irish politics as well. Mm -hmm. Where did your love for Arsenal begin, Kenny? Well, I was, I was born and bred in Islington, and Islington mm -hmm. is my home. In you know, I still I still work for the London Borough of Islington, so I do keep in touch with Islington. I had a season ticket all my life, but it came from my mum because uh, my mum she's the Arsenal fan of the family, and she's the one who was a great influence on me and my brother because we were born in um, Liverpool Road. There used to be a hospital in Holloway, just off Holloway Road, Liverpool Road. Yeah, and our first house was in um, Albert Park, Highbury, so we could actually. Before they put all the barriers up, we could actually see the game from my house. But because um, entry is free, I always considered my first game when I went with unsupervised. But one tells me, well, I was taking you when you were a kid and a baby, but you don't remember. And it was her who, who sold the club to me. But it was a hard sell because, you know, back in the day, Arsenal, you know, they were living off the winning a double in 1971. Liverpool were the team. It was a great team. Great team. So... It was it, you. You had to drum it into, you know, you the Arsenal, Arsenal. And you you say yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think the first time I really got a bug for the Arsenal, and I felt gutted when we lost. Was the night was the 1980, 1980 um, FA Cup final. We lost to West Ham, and that's when I thought, yeah, that's it. It's in my blood. And since yeah. then, it, that's what it's been because you know I've lived in um, Highbury, Crouch Hill, which is Arsenal, and then we moved to Andover State in Fruity Park. And that's where I've been brought up. And um, my next one neighbour, um, God bless his soul, David Head, um, who died, who was taken away from us last year with cardiac arrest. He was only he's only about fifty eight. He missed his fifty eight, but fifty uh, seventh birthday. He was a, he played for Arsenal at the time. So his goalkeeper was um, Gary Lewin, and okay. um, Gary Lewin was there, his goalkeeper. And you know, ref on Mead was. Um, was his goal was his, his teammate and you know Huggy White, Chris White, and so they had all those players and Paul Vassam was in that youth team as well. But obviously he got an injury, and um, you know after Arsenal he, he, he didn't he gave he didn't give up he gave up but he was still playing for the Arsenal Vets. So he was a massive influence as me in terms of not just Arsenal but life and football. So you couldn't be anything else. I know some people try to tempt me a few times to Tottenham. You know, you know I thought no thanks. And um, I I realised I hated Spurs as well. When the night is in the nine eighty two when they when they're playing keep me on, I realised I want to keep you win. So I'm ten years old, and I realised how much I hate the football club, how, how much I hate term. But the first time I went unsupervised without Dave is um nine eighty four, you know December nine eighty four, seventy December. Arsenal were playing Watford one one. Tommy Caton was at uh, was um, was a set of half your boy, Mr. O'Leary, yeah. in um, Stoke Newington, but brought up in Dublin. I'm sure he was an accident of birth, but he's a Londoner. But you won't, he won't be, he does know it for him. <laughs> and then you had uh, Viv Anderson at right back, you had Kenny Sampson, the captain, and you had Stuart Robson in midfield, Paul Davis, Ian Allenson, who who um, put us winding up off a sword from a rebound, and then Les Taylor, um, the Geordie. From Sheffield's E Class Watford, but that's when Johnny Barnes was playing and um, Luther Bisnick came back from um, AC Milan because he was there for a year. So it was it was always a situation where it was that's what got me going. And then you know, our next home game was the North London Derby, which we lost when um, Garth Crook scored the um, sorry, um, Mark Falco scored the winner. So after that, it was Arsenal, 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 and then obviously went to primary school where there was a massive uh, Arsenal contingent. Where there's a few Liverpool fans, few Spurs, and you know the Catholic schools in North London, you know, you know the nationalities, don't you? Yeah, Spanish, <laughs> Italian, and Irish. And even though they had broad Cockney accents, they call them they they were considered Irish, and they would fight if you call them England. They hate to be English. <laughs> I don't know why, but this was this was like, um, Fringy, you know, Thompson Park, Finsbury Park, and then I went to secondary school in Archway, St Aloysius. Again, same Italian, uh, Spanish, Irish, and a few Portuguese. And the Italian boys were the people to be. So the Spanish guys wanted to be Italian because they thought that it was cool to be Italian. You know, like back in the, when you were in school in England, if you're African, you, it, we thought it was more cool to be West Indian because they had the British surnames. <laughs> and yeah. you know, you know, no, no, you know, our, 
you know, you can pronounce their names, their surnames, and they seem a bit cool anyway. You know, the accent, the, you know, and I suppose they've got the girls as well. But it's it's one of those things when you go in secondary school at Ars- in um in the nineteen eighties, it was always Arsenal. You know, we're going away games and over the state where I'm from. It's Arsenal, ter- it's Arsenal, Arsenal, Arsenal. Like, obviously, we don't talk about it, but people who do other things to show their support, and we we'll leave it at that. Mm-hmm. All of them sitting around Andorra Estate and Six Acres. All the big top boys, Andorra Estate, Six Acres. People will tell you if you came to London right now, they'll say, "Go to the Gunners Pub, go to uh, the Eaglet." Go to uh, like a Tollington. No, the Arsenal pubs were the Moray on Durham Road, and then round the corner at Frontal Road was the Duke, where all the Arsenal boys, because we all came from Andover State. Obviously, you had people from the south, but it was always Andover State, Arsenal, where we organised away games, right? Yeah. Obviously, where they still organised away trips all over the country, and obviously home games as well. But you know, it was it was that you had to be Arsenal. There was a few Spurs fans. You know, tripping the back because you know, day you got Spurs fans in your family, and on Andover State, there was your Spurs family, but it was Arsenal like 980. We get to the cup final every house, Arsenal, not Red 79 way. before Arsenal. And it's whenever we, whenever there's a cup final, every, everyone just stops and they got all their colors in the windows on Andover State. You couldn't be anything but Arsenal. It was like what you had to be Arsenal, you had to be like, it's just, you know, um, Andover State. You used to have like um, you know when you you know when you used to have like these radio stations, you know like you know Radio Caron illegal. Well, yeah, they they used to they used to do all the, all the Arsenal reports up there as well. So it, that's how I started my Arsenal journey. And obviously, you know, for every North London boy, it's nine eighty nine, isn't it? Yeah, it's a nineteen eighty nine right. season. I was lucky enough to get to Highbury once, and it was in two thousand and one. Mm. That was my first ever game. It was Arsenal and Manchester United, uh, nil all draw, actually. Mm. Since then, Kenny, I've been to seven Arsenal games, including the League Cup final a few years ago against Man City, where we got trashed oh, in one don't. of our in one of don't. our worst performances I'll met, ever. I'll met you there. That, that and I, no, I, I was in the away end. <laughs> that was made, made it even worse. Oh right, I was so, in I was in you, the Man City end. Mind you, that you know Irish and Manchester, you know maybe you had a few. That you know, big contingent of Manchester. I can understand it, but I was with still, a City fan. Oh, fair enough. Yeah, I'm, I'm it was sure, the only sure, tickets sure, we could I'm get. Sure was, I'm sure he's pleasant with to you. And yeah, you, he, he was. Didn't make you feel too bad. <clears throat> yeah, so Kenny, I've been to seven games and we've won none of them. So I've decided I might not go for a while. <laughs> you, you know, you know what's happened is that you, you, you know, you had my experience that I used to have in the eighties. Yeah. So when I was in the eighties. In 1979, if you talk about Alan Sunderland when getting that goal in, in the 88 and the 90th minute, well, we didn't win anything for eight years. We didn't even get to a final. We got to a semi final in, um, um, in 1983 when Man United beat us um, in both the League Cup and, the, and uh, the FA Cup. But apart from that, we really, really struggled until that great team from George Graham. Like, George Graham is going to get a lot of credit because he, he bloodied it because Rowcastle playing that team. You know, you had players like Martin Hayes, you know, Tony Adams, you know, come through. Paul Merson was also just, he wasn't starting, he didn't come through, but you had that kind of fulcrum there where they built from the um, from the youth side. And then you had Michael Thomas coming through as well. But it was actually Terry Neal on, on Don Howe who set those foundations because, you know, it was their youth set up, especially Don Howe's, which, you know, Don Howe gave um, David Rokas so his, his debut the season before. Noel Quinn got it. I left that Noel Quinn as well. Noel Quinn yeah. got his debut under Don Howe as well. And then, so all those players, and then um, it was Don Howe, it was Terry Neal gave um, Ter- Tony Adams his debut in 83 against um, Sunderland, a game which we lost. So they were had a fast suit experience, but the, in terms of being made first team regulars, it was George Graham who did that. And that's where I call that the, my greatest Arsenal team in terms of my where the Renaissance started because he needed mm-hmm. George. You know, came from Millwall, second division. But I don't know. As soon as George came to, t- to the club, you just he had that presence where, it wasn't the fact that he was Mister Arsenal, but he, he he had this attitude that his first words he said that endeared me to. I was fourteen. Was I want to reawaken the Seacombe Giant? 
And then when he said that, I generally believed that we could challenge because that season we went on a 25, um, 20 game unbeaten run where, mm-hmm. we, you know, where we won at um, Goodison Park, won some really good games. And it gave us that that feeling where, you know what, we could do something. And we actually were leading the league table up until uh, yeah, January, then we kind of fell away and Everton and Liverpool took over. But blooding those youngsters, winning the league, it was cut, beating Liverpool. Remember when Rushy scores, Liverpool never lost? Well, they did that day. And that's where it all started. And I, I, when you talk about the Wenger years and our great times, August 86, the first game against Man United, it was 1-0, one, one, one Tynica scored. That is where, when Arsenal, for me, started becoming a club that be feared, a big club. That day, I saw it that day. Oh, I don't know what happened there. No, no. I don't know. I think you'd be, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you fine. It just it just cut off and then came back. I know. So, so, yeah, but what I'm trying to say is that when you talk about Arsenal Renaissance, George Graham, George Graham, in terms of making those team guys regulars, that set their foundations for, um, you know, the 1989, you know, like miracle, miracle. Yeah. That should have been miracle because we're leading the league all season, but that a miracle. I didn't we, go to the game. Yeah. Loads of people say they were there, but I didn't go, <laughs> so I could just say that. Me, me, and you kind of come from different eras because I, my first time I remember really getting into football, I was nine at the time. So it was 1997. That was when we were kind of, we won the double in 98. So it was kind mm. of the season before that I was watching things. And from then until about 2004, like we were the best team in the land for sure. 100%. 100%. And you know, and what's happened is that when we went in transition, it wasn't a long transition. But if you look at if you look at the situation, while we were the best, you know, Wenger didn't touch the defence. You know, he, he, you know, players like, you know, Dixon, Winterburn, Adams, Bold, Keon, and obviously he inherited Ian Wright, Dennis Burkamp, mm-hmm. game at all. So he had that fulcrum. Where, and also what he did is that he recognised that, you know, the French leagues, at the time, players who came from the French league could adapt to English football because he was getting players who were physically big. So if you look at the prototype of player when Arsenal were at their best, it was basically we're a team of all seasons. It wasn't a ticky, it was ticky tacker, but you had players who could mix it, play mm. the ball long. If players want, if teams want to kick us off the park, you couldn't do that because all our players, big, physically strong, and they yeah. can mix it. And you had players like Adams who said, right, it's a battle today, let's have it. And even if you look at Dennis Burkamp, six foot, he was a big lad as well, so he could have it. And Perez, he, he, he had to learn the hard way that you had to be able to mix it inside the overmiles because that's how you play in England. And that's where Wenger got it right. And I think that's that. there's no doubt that Man United feared us. They, they feared us and respected us, but it was fear. You know, they knew they couldn't compete with us in 98 because of the physical type. And they had to devise tactics, i.e. try to kick us off the park to match us physically and a kind of proper type of player. So those are great Wenger years. You can't deny that. You know, albeit foundations with George, but it was the mentality and the fact that, you know, he had the French market to himself. And plus, you know, he was ahead of his... He, he, we were ahead of our times in football we played. You know what I mean? I think that's when we, we really remember. Because yeah, Arsene Wenger's not a coach. He's not a coach. That's not an insult with him. He's like Bob Paisley mm-hmm. and managers in the 80s where, you know, if you, I'm sure you hear a lot of Graham Sinness where he used to, always, Graham Sinness used to say that, and John Barnes is a proponent of that as well, they didn't train you at Liverpool. They bought you, bought you where you've had about three or four years' experience where you know how to play football. So you've got to work it out yourself in training, and you've got to work it yourself out in a in a match. You know, experienced players know how to get themselves out of situations. Experienced players know are managers in the field. The same thing with Arsenal. You know, you could, he didn't have to coach Tony Adams and the, and the back four, or. Because they could be his leaders and managers in the field, so he was able to he was able to do that, where they had to work out themselves. So he's a throwback to the old old style, you know, blackball yeah. managers. I think, and then unfortunately, he changed it with Vieira. He went, he tried to do the tiki taka style, because um, we had Fabregas, because of from you know from um, La, La Meza from uh, you know in Barcelona. So he, 
it became small, gifted players, technical players. And then Spain became successful, which is the worst thing I think happened to Arsenal. So yep. we were basically playing that kind of football, but we weren't doing the hard work of the, of the ball. But again, he changed it. But what was happening is teams like Chelsea were copying the Arsenal prototype like under Mourinho, where they had big lads and playing man for all season football and getting stuck in. And then teams were kicking us to the park because they could, because we weren't doing the hard work of the ball. We just relied on that good football, relied on referees. And I think that's where a decline started on the football field. It was never about, for me, um, monetary reasons in terms of, um, you know, building the stadium. Because even though we were building the stadium, we are still a top four club, which means because we were part of that cartel in the top four, we, ha- we, we, we basically could outspend any team outside the top four. So the top four was easy for us to get. So when people say that Arsenal Wenger did well to keep us in the top four, that's got to be one of the biggest myths ever. Yeah. We're always going to be there. If you have if you have more money to spend, and you uh, you have and you have and you're in the Champions League every season, then you're going to be able to get better players than teams outside the top four. People don't people don't people don't read it because they they think that Arsenal Wenger's success um, was what keep in the top four. That's not success. His success no. is. 98 up until 2005 when he won the FA Cup. That's when he was... And he would be the first person to say that. A proud man like Arsene Wenger surely wouldn't use getting the top four as a success. That's not the Arsene Wenger I know. The Arsene Wenger I know is a, a proud man. All right. Mm-hmm. You know full well that I was I was one of the people that were asking for him to replace and win the marches. But that was for Arsenal. It wasn't personal. It was just me putting the club first. I think when he left that there there's no real ill will towards him now from the majority of fans. Like I think everyone kind of respects him. It was just time for a change, really, wasn't it? I think what's happened is it depends, though, because I think what's happened is that there there is resentment because of the fact that he left eventually. Hmm. Because, you know, because sometimes, you know, or if you want me to put it in later, so ladies welcome. You know, you look at yeah. the times where the, there there was, you know, the first person, the first time I heard of a movement to ask last thing to replace was in 2008. I wouldn't go in 2009. Then you had people, then you had the 8 2, people asked him to go. Then there was mm. Blackburn at home and 13 people wanting him to go. Then, you know, and then, but in between that, before that was Birmingham, when we lost to Birmingham, where people wanted yes, to go. Yes, the cup final, so, yeah. Really and truly, it's really and truly, they'll opportunity, really and truly. And then, you know, they, when one gets whole, it was like, oh, yeah, let this be a last hurrah, let's move on. And then by that time, managers were available because there was always the argument there's no one available. Well, for Yellow was available. Not saying that we would have got him, but if it, it is a vacancy and, you know, we played a brand of football that Barcelona played, it, we're a big club. And I just think that that's why there still is resentment towards Arsene Wenger because I of think- the fact that. I think your good friend Claude summed it up well when when he said it before. The milk has gone stale. That's one of his like well, and, all-time and, and catchphrases. And, 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 and he was exactly right because you know if you associate Arsenal being successful years, that's challenge being challenged for the title. You know, obviously, even when he, even when we were great sides, he was he's awful in Europe because the blackball managers were beating him because when you play in the Champions League and which is basically a cup competition. You have to, you be able to, you know, it's tactics, you know, have a team for horses and courses, you know. So even though you had the great players, which you had, our best effort under the Arsenal Ring was one, uh, one um, uh, semi final and in the final and uh, one final. But we had a great side mm-hmm. Petit Vieira and Adams, Seaman and Cole, Overmars. You know, Anelka, Omri, and we couldn't, and we only got one final. Mm. So you know, team, that's and that's the thing. You know, we were we were brilliant in the league, which is hard. We we were able to win the hardest league in in football, but in Europe, that's where us again. You got to look at Arsene Wenger's um, legacy and feel very disappointed. And I'm not talking about after 2005, after 2006, before that. You know, it's not a good return, mm-hmm. in my opinion. Where do you think that we're at now under this manager? 
to be honest, I like it to a situation like I don't know, like when I was four, when I was fourteen, fifteen, I was in. You know, you when you're doing your A levels and GCSEs, you do yeah coursework. Like yes, like for instance, you're in the fourth. The fourth year is when you first get your coursework, or you may get in the third year, but the fourth year where basically you start your course like that, and that counts towards your exams, final mm -hmm. result. So even though they, they jam it into you, you've got to do well, you've got, it's really important. In the fifth year, they tell you, this is not your play yet, it's really important. So basically, you have a lot of Arsenal fans are saying last season, give them some time, we're in transition, right? And, you know, he has to be able to find his best players. This season coming along, is what I, I cite as the fifth year, I your the, the year you sit your your GCSE or O level exams where you have to be serious. You know, you have to be able to have an identify way of playing. You have to have a uh, you know your own players and you've got to be able to basically be on the front foot where you have to be determined by your results. You have mm -hmm. to be. All right, you could. I know you people say, well, Liverpool's strong, the squad is strong, Leicester's strong, uh, Spurs could be strong on a new manager. Um, we know Man City are going to be strong, Man United are going to buy big, Chelsea will buy big, but you have to, you still have to be able to challenge because that's his first full season where he has to, he stops being a coach and he becomes a manager where it's results. And the reason why Arsenal did badly last season is because he didn't have a defined definite style of play. He was changing things which needed to be changed. He never had us on the front foot. It's no coincidence with his tactics. Um uh we had a we have all right if you look at our forward line that's worth about 180 million pounds, 190 million pounds. You try mm. to tell me that forward line that forward line is enough to scare the prem, teams in the premiership. Yet of course it is we were the luck yet yet we're the lowest goal scorers. Why are we lowest goal scorers? Players lose form, fair enough. Manager's tactics, 90% of the time. He was too... He's too negative. negative. Yeah, he concentrates too much on making us difficult to beat, making us do the hard yards off the ball, but hang on here. Just, if, you, if, you've got, if you've got a group of players, you play to their strengths. Because when you play to a team's strengths, you, get, you win more matches, score more goals, and get better results. Yes, hmm. You will lose the six pointers against Man City and Man United, but who did we lose to last season? Who didn't we lose to? Yeah, but if you all right, if you, all right. It's, you look at the teams we, we normally lose to Liverpool. Um, we didn't lose to Liverpool. Um, we normally lose to Man City. We lose to them. We lost to them. Leicester normally gives a hiding as well. But the but Wolves home and away, Aston Villa home and away, Burnley at home. You know, you know we've you know we we seem we seem to be better in the in the bigger games, kind of like our FA Cup run the season before, I guess. Well, yeah, because simply reason the bigger games. That's when I'm, if you look at the bigger games, the bigger games like a cup match, horses for courses. Mm. You you basically have definite tactics. You basically say right, you're stopping teams from playing. You're stopping the opposition's goal threat. You know what I mean? And you'll you, so. In a cup game, when you're playing a team like Man City, Liverpool, you're pressing them, and then you're hitting them in a counter attack. But you have a plan. Mm. So, for instance, if you look in cup games, the best team doesn't always win. But a team that's yeah. that, that you know is clinical and basically has the has a definite style of play and, and tactics in order to fault the offices and strengths win those games. Well, you look at. Uh, you look if you translate into league games, Man United at home, Man United away, that was typical where we managed to impose ourselves at Man United and managed to get an extra man in midfield and then use our pace in the counter attack. And, th and that's how we, we beat them. But we weren't playing like that all the time against teams that you should be beating. You should be on the front foot. You shouldn't be, pl you shouldn't be lopsided and, and um, putting people around, around holes. And I think. That's why Tech has got to struggle. But one thing we'll say, fans are going to be worried about the, the um, players we're getting in, but they need to realise that every football club, especially Arsenal, have to use every minute, every hour, and every day of the transfer window. The motto for Arsenal fans is the transfer window ends on the 31st of August. 
which means we are going to have a situation where we are going to buy players after the Brentford game and after the Chelsea game. And we may have a few um, knock-on effect and poor results. But we're going to, you know, the players we want to leave and the players we, we want to come in, they're not going to just give it give us give us a free wide to clubs. They're going to exhaust every penny out. And that's that's why you need time. I'm going to give you three opinions I have about Arsenal. I want to see if you agree with them or not. I'm yeah. just going to shoot the three, out of, the three of them at you, right? Bern Leno is not as good as he thinks he is. Aubameyang Agreed. deserves a second chance. And Callum Chambers is our best right back. But Leno is not a top number one. He's a, he would be a good number two. But yeah. as, a, as a number one, he's not in a class of um, Edison or Allison. And, and you know, and it, there's no, and it, I, it's no surprise to me that um, we're looking at players like Anana, and we're looking at players like Johnston and Ramsdale, who who are young, up and coming keepers. All right, they struggled, yeah. but I'm not sure it's funny, right? If you're if you're if you're playing for Sheffield United and West Bromwich Albion, then you're you're going to let in them more goals than an Arsenal goalkeeper, and you're yeah. going to be involved in them. Um, situations where you may have made the odd mistake but the reason why you're going to make the odd mistake because constant pressure where yeah. you're, you're 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 when you're defending for most of the time or you're a keeper where you're you're having shot after shot cross coming in after cross coming in a set pieces to deal with free kicks or or corner routines of course you're going to be under pressure but they're England goalkeepers and because they're England goalkeepers and young then I was also going to look another way layman you know Leno, um, is you know didn't get a game in Euros. You know, yeah. he, he he probably is going to look at the next man as a flick. And flicks where he said, "Look, mate, if you want to challenge um, for my number one, you need to be playing in Champions League and top class football." So it's, it's a career choice for Leno. A Bamiang, the, the biggest elephant in the room of Bamiang is that we need a top class centre forward who could do all the disciplines, play with their back to goal, hold the ball up, play on the shoulder and score goals and run the channels. Now, a bad man can't do all of them. And his best position for me is on the left-hand side. But as long as Mick Arteta is, in, is his, our manager and he's playing that style of play, then a bad man, you, you, wait, you might as well not have a bad man here because you're not going to get the best out of bad man. Another thing as well is that, you know, you obviously, because of what he's done, you've got to give him a second chance. You've got to. Yeah. yeah. But moving forward, in terms of like, if you're in a situation where you've got to balance the books up, and there's still clubs, you know, at it who's going to pay, you know, 50 million pounds. You have to consider it. You know, look at his age and think, well, we're a business. You know, we've got, and you've got, you've got to decide, have we got the best out of them? History says at the moment we have got the best out of, um, you know, um, Pierre, and we may not get any better, but, you know, football's all about opinions and all about changing them. Callum Chambers, our best right back. Well, it's not hard, is it? No. <laughs> I, 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 I was, uh, we were talking off air, um, Harry, Harry Simeon put up a poll, um, I was watching his podcast last night and he said that uh, he was surprised. He said, who is the best right back that we have, uh, if Bellerin goes? Is it Chambers, is it Cedric? And 78%, I think it was Chambers and 22 Cedric. And he, he was shocked by that because he thinks Cedric is uh, is a better option than Chambers. Yeah, but long term, you, you, you know, if you look at the shopping list we need to do, we need a shot. We need to. We need to get another midfielder. We need to get a number eight or a number ten. People say, "Well, you've got chain. You've got um, Smith Rowe. Why get another player? Well, why not? If you're a big club, you need to get the best players available. You need. To, if Smith Rowe's good enough to play for Arsenal, then he'll be able to see if the challenge, just like Mason Mount, saw the challenge of um, of um, Ch. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, and Havertz for a certain extent at Chelsea, where he made himself undroppable. Firstly, on the big Frank and undroppable under Tuchel, and with the national side. Again, he's he's embraced the competition and made himself first choice. Smith Rowe has to has to understand that it's competition for places. This is not oh yeah, he's one of our own. Let's see how he goes. Well, we haven't got nine of it. We finished eighth from the last two seasons. We need to win trophies. As I was saying before, you know, Chambers, you know, you have to have a situation where you got to have a, a higher caliber of player. And yeah. let's face it, we've got an open the Cronkays have got an open goal now. You know, they're there's um, there's fantasy satisfaction because of the ESL, led by Sky, mm -hmm. because Sky didn't want to knew full well that the ESL. They were going to lose TV, some money. 
yeah, and they know the ESL got a TV deal with um with um with another with another TV station that's not Sky. So of course they're gonna you know get the drum at and say, oh yeah, this is bad for football. And then what you do, you get your most northern northern um, um, pundits. You don't get Jerry Radnack, um, Sullivan East End, from Bournemouth, who sounds southern. You don't get a you you don't you don't get a Mick Richards. You know you get your most northern. The Scouser and the Mank, yeah, don't you? And then they'll the say, boys. "Oh, how working class they are," and blah blah. And it works. I mean, it was the biggest con ever. But saying that, getting back to the point about the Cron case, you know, they're saying they want to listen to fans. They're saying they want to engage with fans. So lap it up, spend money. Football fans are simple souls, mate. We don't care about getting a seat on the board or having a conversation. We just want. We just want the best team available to have the best players at the Emirates and win trophies. That's all we want. Yeah. Before we wrap up, Kenny, I want to know from you, what constitutes as a, as a good season and where do you think we'll finish and what we'll do? Well, a good season for Arsenal is if they get in the top four. That's the bare minimum. Mm -hmm. And that used to be like that before. Well, yeah, the reason why it wasn't like that before, for simple reasons, is that we it's what we're putting eggs in one basket and we weren't challenging because when you're in a, when you're a top four club, you have to go higher. You have to challenge. Like mm -hmm. if you're a man, if you, if you like Chelsea under Bramwich, when they won the league, the next step for a Bramwich was to win the Champions League. Man United, Man City, when it, now it's the Champions League, the Holy Grail because same with Man United, you know, you know, full well under Sir Alex, it was the, it was a Champions League. It's our thing because we, we won a double. If you, Doubles went and Vitzball was a Champions League. So whatever, whatever thing you settle, wherever you're, if you're a top four team, then you've got a challenge for the league. Spurs were a top four team. They were talking about challenge for the title because that was the next best thing. It's not settling, and that's why we got upset with the top four and the last thing because we were settling for the top four, and yeah. people sat, saw it as success. That that's why why when people you know say that you know if you get a top four. And um, but you you didn't like us thing. They're being lazy and manipulative. You know full well that when you when you when you're in a position, you want to go one better. That's logic. But some fans who who see Arsenal Wenger as some sort of um, you know the equivalent of um, Zeus or Jupiter, why not just you know basically they still call him the daddy. I mean, yeah, yeah, he, 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 he had a book out which was basically a book of fairy tales. I mean. I think watching um watching um Ghostbusters um cartoon is probably more interested than that. But <laughs> but you know, it's one of those things where, you know, people will rewrite history. That's why Uno Emery is a devil incarnate, even though Arsene Wenger left us a mess. Because Uno Emery uh, was a full guy and had that debacle in Baku and you know, managed to you know, snatch um, the Europa League from the, the jaws of the Champions League. All on him. He's only been here five minutes. All the bad things that were Arsenal, all the poor tactics, all the situations with poor player acquisitions and player attitude, all on one man who was here for 18 months. Do me a yeah. favour, mate. Come on. <laughs> Come on. It's silly, isn't it? Yeah, it is. He kind of got shafted in a way. Where are we going to finish this year, Kenny? If our, if, if our tech is our manager, we're going to finish where we finished last season. Eighth again, yeah, because I don't, I generally don't believe that he's gonna he's gonna get us a definite definite def, definite style of play, and that we're still gonna be lopsided. And I think, and I, I still think that he's rather than be a coach, he's gonna rather be a manager. He's gonna be a coach, and right now Arsenal need a man manager who who puts getting results above everything. This isn't an experiment. It's not a play here. You know, you know, I'm afraid. All the people are going to ask who come on your show, and you know, I'm not going to name them, but they've been on the show and they've said the same things to you. Give him some time, where it's a five year cycle, and that, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day, and you're spoiled and you're self entitled. And they'll give you every stat available about why Mikel's done a good job. And they'll explain the, the way the fact that we've lost about, we're, we're, how, many, how many home games did we lose this season? Nine? How many games we lose? About 14, 15, 14 in the league? They'll explain away that because 
Rick Hill's in transition and that they've seen that, you know, they'll tell you. The defence has improved. Well, they'll tell you that we're the third best team in terms of results uh, since Boxing Day. They'll tell you that. And they'll actually mm. keep a straight face and tell you that. <laughs> I'm sorry, but, you know, I'm talking to an Irishman who's used to Eamon Dunphy, Johnny Giles. You're calling it as it is as well. Calling as it is. Graham Sinesse, when he always comes on the radio to the Vizera, and the first thing he says is, you wouldn't be able to say that on Sky or in the BBC. What you... And he says that. And I've seen, I heard yeah. him do that. You know, Johnny Giles um, got a gig in the, the Premiership. They never used him after one time because he was too blunt. I mean, the only, <laughs> the only, the only one is allowed to be blunt. In, in There's only two pundits allowed to be blunt. Roy Keane and Graves and S. All the rest of them have to be have to be have to be um, inoculated or vaccinated with kinsmanship. They knew what they were getting. I think with Roy Keane, it's about ratings, it's about website clicks, it's about videos, it's about all that stuff these days. I think you, you know what he's a Marmite character who is the most watchable. Per- he's watchable. Here's mm. the here's the Liam, Liam Gallagher, Liam Gallagher of um, of um, punditry. Liam Gallagher. If you go on his Twitter. Millions of followers follows no one. Roy Keane Instagram follows no one. I don't know where it's where you Celts, but you, you where it's a Celtish thing or not. But you know, because because of the, I think one is you're very eloquent speakers. You explain yourselves. You explain, give reasons, and I think that's why I, I do like, and I do have a lot of respect for Keane, and yeah. you know, Liam Le- Gaher, is that. I, you know, maybe it's a, I don't know, I don't want to be stand up as stereotype, but it's, you have to tell people what the truth. You have to say that if they're watching a football match, that if the grass is green, this happened and this happened. Call it black and, this and is white. This why it happened. You can't, you can't, you know what I mean? You can't be subjective when, when something factual happens, or you lose football matches, or, or you finish eighth for the table. There's nothing subjective about it. You finished eighth. You're not in Europe. You know, you finish below uh, West Ham and <laughs> Tottenham yeah, again. Christ. Kenny, it was an absolute pleasure, and hopefully oh, we might yourself. catch we, we might catch up during the season again. Oh, well, absolutely! I'll, I'll, I'll be I'll be well upset if you didn't give me a call again. You know what I mean? I've enjoyed every minute of it. Yeah, brilliant. You know, you know, you know. At the end of the day, the end of the day, the only difference between me and you is is, is probably a is probably a. I I I am um, use pound pound sterling. You use the euros. Apart from that, yeah. it's all the same. An English breakfast is the same as an Irish breakfast. It's bacon eggs and scrambled eggs and a bit of toast. It's only the fact that they call it in, you call it Irish, we call it English. Yeah, brilliant, Kenny. Thanks a million, man. I enjoyed myself. Speak to you soon.